Chapter 131 Sam awoke with a groan, clenching his teeth in pain as his body was racked with agony. There was a notification waiting for him, which he clicked on, more to distract himself than anything else. You have killed a juvenile cyclops. You have leveled up. X4 It had given him four whole levels, which meant that the cyclops had been far beyond his own strength. Those level-ups had healed him somewhat, but not fully. The damage had been too much. Sam had only beaten it through sheer luck. It had still been almost too much for him. Sam would have instantly died if the creature had been his size. A large body was a great boon, but it could also be a curse. Sam lay back, not mentally prepared to go through his final threshold. Then he had an interesting thought. Every time that he had gone through a threshold before, his body had been returned to its ideal state afterwards. There was a chance that completing the trial would heal him fully. There was also the chance that he wouldn't survive it, but he didn't really have a choice. Stranded out here in the wilderness with a heavily damaged body was a death sentence anyway. At least this way he would have a chance of survival. Sam prepared himself and placed the final points into dexterity. A feeling of agonizing stretching took over his body, combining with his broken bones, to fill him with an exquisite agony. He roared in pain, and then his muscles started to compress, elongating and becoming denser. His limbs became marginally longer, and his heart started to pump blood at a far faster rate. With one final surge of pain, Sam was finished. He took a deep breath, and the air tasted sweeter than anything he had ever tasted before. Two notifications showed up, the normal threshold one, and something else. Sam put aside the second one, but he felt a strange desire to open it as soon as he could. It felt important. For now, he checked on his threshold notification. You have passed the first threshold of dexterity. Speed, agility, and elegantly applied strength. These are the central tenets of dexterity. Combined, these factors can temper the muscles of a raging brute, accentuate the spellcasting abilities of a mage, and even teach a follower of the path of speed more about himself. This is an often maligned stat, seen as the less effective bastard son of strength, but in reality, it is its equal. Choose one of the aspects of dexterity to follow, or all three. Your path will alter based on this, but for the better. It was an interesting notification as it implied that there were multiple aspects of dexterity. Sam ignored that for now, and finally let himself succumb to the desire to open up the second notification. Congratulations, Sam Atlas. You have taken the first step on the road to Zenith. The road to Zenith is a metaphysical path to the heights of the cultivating world, and its followers line the ranks of the upper echelons of the boundless expanse. You have proven that you are among their numbers by setting foot on this path. First step, complete all initial thresholds, before F rank. Rewards, your fate mark has deepened. Sam frowned as he read this. Did this mean that the urge to complete all of his thresholds had been something to do with this? He had briefly heard about causality before, and the strange ways in which it operated. Had fate forced him along this path, because he had some great destiny? In any case, this was a welcome notification if not one that provided any tangible benefit save for the mysterious fate mark, whatever that was. It was more of a milestone notification, to remind him of how far he had come. In addition, the path that he was on had an intriguing name, and he wanted to follow it to the end for both himself and so that he could complete his quest to save his father. He had not forgotten about the overlord, in whom his father's mind was trapped, but he had filed it away for now, so that he could do more effective things. In any case, it was time for him to return to the faction headquarters. At long last, it was time to begin the final preparations for the hardest challenge that Earth would face so far. It was time to see just what the engines of the End Times quest had in store for them. Sam's new speed was like night and day compared to before he had set out. He was easily twice as fast, if not more, and he could run at upwards of a hundred miles per hour now, without even breaking a sweat. It was like being a real-life superhero. Before the extra strength that he had felt like it was almost unreal in a way, like he was hallucinating or just not paying attention to what was going on. 
It had been far beyond a human's normal strength, but because everyone he was fighting was relative to him, or at least above the par for humanity, he had not really noticed it. It was the first time that he realized that he was experiencing power creep, but in real life. If he was an anime character, this would have been when he would travel back to fight his very first enemy, and show them how powerful he had gotten, but unfortunately this was not an anime. His first opponent, Lena Scarlet, was long dead, and he had killed her. Sam chuckled to himself softly. Damn, that's pretty dark. I can't imagine that being in any of those kids' anime that I watched when I was younger. The thought, although it was completely matter-of-fact, was funny to him. It was funny in a morbid sort of way, but still enough to get him to laugh. Examples of humor were few and far between in the twilight days of old Earth, and there probably wouldn't be that much of it in the years to come either. Sam shook his head, and kept running. He had not seen another of the undead creatures since he had fought the arboreal defender, but he had noticed a few glowing eyes in the shadows of the trees that peered out at him, and vanished when he looked back. Sam was unsure of what exactly was going on, but none of the creatures whose eyes those were trying to attack him, so he paid them no heed. Instead, Sam plied the depths of his vast memory to find the exact way back to the faction headquarters. A few hours later, he broke into the despoiled wasteland that surrounded the headquarters, and spotted the wall in the distance. There were a few dark smudges inside of the wall, and he tried to make them out. Sam was too far however, so he waited until he got closer. As soon as he came within a mile of the complex, a whistling noise rang out and a ballista bolt, glowing with mana, landed on the ground in front of him, detonating and blowing a crater out of the earth. He shouted an alarm and spotted someone manning a turret on the top of the walls. He lifted his mace up, and the person recognized him, because they scurried off down the stairs and towards the center of the headquarters. Sam kept on running towards the east gate, and as he approached it opened slowly. Standing there were his ten captains and racks. Behind them, Sam could see a very different landscape to when he had left. An entire small city filled the central area of the enclosure and all around it small farms and grazing areas covered the land. Windmills dotted the area, although Sam was unsure of what exactly they were for. Eduardo stepped up and saluted Sam. Welcome back. I can tell that you are surprised at the changes that we have made in your absence. Let me just tell you one thing. That man, Okita, is a true genius when it comes to money. He set up a tithe system in a few hours that is universally accepted and thus far nobody has tried to evade it. Using that money, we were able to build up the area into a self-sustaining city. In addition, we upgraded the defenses by quite a bit. Eduardo pointed towards the center of the city, where a titanic cannon stood, exuding an aura of menace. Is that what I think it is? Sam asked. The captains nodded. We bought the superior mana cannon. We tested it once, and it's most definitely worth it. The cost was a bit hard to justify, but after the populace saw it in action, they started cheering, Eduardo answered. Sam raised an eyebrow. I can guess at how powerful something like that might be. With a 1.5 million credit price tag that is. What did you use it for? On the other side of the city, there's a permanent crater now from when we used it on another one of those dire bears. The only problem with it is that it uses an assload of mana to fire, Jeffrey said. Lau stepped forward abruptly and peered at Sam. Your fate feels different than before. Just what happened out there? It's a long story, one that I will tell when we get back to the city hall. I want to talk with Okita about this plan of his. Sam started towards the city hall, but Claude cleared his throat. Okita set up residence in a separate area. He created a new financial district for the city. Financial district? Sam said, confused. You'll see. Chapter 132 A few minutes later, the group had reached a small sector of buildings, all with people streaming in and out of them. The central building looked like an old world bank, with an arched entrance and rows of tellers on the inside. Well, the tellers were actually robots, but they acted the same. In the center of this organized chaos, Okita sat on a chair, writing furiously. 
As Sam drew near, the man still did not see him, and he heard a few of the words that Okita was muttering. Dividends will not come into effect, the man cut off as he saw the large group approaching him. Hmm? I'm not one of the tellers. Oh, faction leader, it's you. He said, finally recognizing Sam. Okita got up out of his chair and shook Sam's hand vigorously. The thin Japanese man had a wide smile on his face as he tugged Sam off with him somewhere. They walked to the back of the bank, and Okita pulled out a key from his pocket, slotting it into a small hole in a vault door. The inside of the vault was empty, save for a deep metaphysical sense of wealth. It was a very strange feeling, but one that was clear to Sam. This was some sort of repository for credits. Sure enough, Okita explained what it was a moment later. This bank allows for us to collect interest on our faction funds. People can individually deposit money, but they have a lower interest rate. This was a very expensive purchase, but we've already made back a few hundred thousand credits. Having millions of credits in capital is no joke. So, Okita, I was informed that you created a new tithe system for the faction. How exactly does that work? Sam asked, interested in how the man was managing the faction funds. It wasn't because he didn't trust Okita or anything, but because he didn't know the first thing about finance, and he wanted to learn more. Okita lit up upon hearing about his project, and he pulled out a series of graphs and diagrams from his pockets. So you see here the median gains over time are dash. No, no, not the mathy stuff. I mean just how it's working. How did you implement it? Sam said. Oh, I see. What I am basically doing is creating a system or reciprocity. For each specific sum of credits that a citizen pays, they gain a token that they can use to get food and so on. They're still losing out by a lot, but it's quite popular. In addition, similar to how lotteries worked in the past, there is a small chance for someone to win big out of the total sum of these tithes. This was partly my idea, but Okita implemented the main financial aspects, Lao added. I was able to make the system even more efficient by using my DAO. I see. So how much money has been collected in the past few days? Sam asked. Well, each citizen has voluntarily given us 10,000 credits, and some of them have given even more. Multiplied by the number of people here, we have over 17 million credits in the bank. We spent a fair bit on city upgrades, but we still have quite a bit for a rainy day, Okita said. Damn, that's a lot of money. How exactly does this bank work? I don't remember seeing it in the Metropolis Corps. Well, when you were gone, the others, and I experimented with the Corps, Eduardo said. We found that there are certain buildings locked behind specific pieces of knowledge. For example, a hospital cannot be built unless the builder is knowledgeable about medicine and healing. Okita did not have access to the core, as he was not a captain, but he was able to designate one of us as his proxy. It added a 1.5 times multiplier to the cost, but that was fine, given how much money we have. How many buildings have you found like this? We found about 50 unique buildings, all related to various professions. We have only been able to build a few, the most important ones, but I can tell you the basics. Most of them were various standard municipal assets, such as a brewery, an armory, and so forth. Wait, an armory? Like an actual smithy? Sam asked. Actually, yes. Because the nature of the system allows for any sort of weapon or armor to be effective, antique weaponry and armor is much more valuable than it was before sometimes even more so than modern weapons. Your mace is a prime example of this, George said, confusing everyone with his sudden wellspring of knowledge. Noting the glances, the heavy-set man grinned. I may be a bit slow, but I used to operate a forge in my farm. I made all of my tools from scratch, and made some money by selling horseshoes. In fact, I'm the one who is running our armory. There are already a few sets of armor ready, and I feel like you would be a good fit, the man added. Seeing an opportunity to resume his work. Okita smiled. That sounds like a great idea. Why don't you take our illustrious leader to go see your wares? 
The way that Okita said that made the statement sound more than a little suspect, but Sam didn't point it out. He had an image to preserve, and it was not of an immature man-child who laughed at body comments. George led Sam out of the bank, and the rest of the captains started to peel away, citing a need to resume their work. Sam didn't know how they had so much work, seeing as so much of the complex was automated, but he trusted their judgment. Rax padded along beside them, and the herpetipede smiled at Sam, a strange toothy expression that looked quite comical. He didn't seem to have anything to say though, so Sam merely smiled back. The armory was on the other side of town, and George opened the doors wide as they reached it. There aren't many people looking for armor these days, but perhaps after they see you with it on, they will change their minds, George said while doing this. The interior of the armory was filled with crude-looking weapons that gradually grew more and more professional-looking as they reached the back of the room. There were three sets of armor as well, a set of studded leather, one of chainmail, and one of full plate. Did you make all of these? Sam asked. Sure did. Boosted my smithing skills quite a bit too. I'm still a novice-ranked smith, but I'm close to the next rank. Why don't you try the armor for size? They look too large for me, Sam said, pointing at the suits that were clearly designed for a man of George's stature. Don't worry about that, they shift size, to match the wearer. Sam frowned at this, but moved over to the armor anyway. He was interested in the middle set, the chainmail one. The leather one was too light for a melee fighter like him, and the plate armor was too restrictive, at least with his current stats. Sam pulled it off the rack, and stared at it, unsure of how exactly to put it on. Uh, George. Oh, I'll help you with that. It needs to bond to you, before you can access the utility features. Utility features? Sounds good, Sam said, unsure of what the other man meant. George grabbed a paring knife from a table, probably for working with leather, and suddenly jabbed Sam's thumb. Ow. Oh. What the hell? Sam exclaimed, more out of shock than anything else. George ignored him, and flicked the drop of blood onto the armor. It immediately shrunk to Sam's size, and then enveloped him fully, before automatically fitting itself to him. Sam was fully clothed in his armor a moment later, and as he looked down at it, he had a strange sense of pride. He no longer looked like a hillbilly Renaissance fair actor, but an actual knight. His overalls had served him well, but that time was over now. Sam checked the stats of the armor next. Basic chainmail. G-rank armor. This armor is a somewhat crude initial project of a smith new to his craft, but it is serviceable nonetheless. It is enchanted with basic system granted enhancements, which include various utility features such as auto-cleaning and equipping. In addition, it is much more durable than any mundane suit of armor imbued with the power of its maker. It was a commonplace description for a commonplace set of armor. The item was neither extremely poor, nor very good. It was good enough for Sam though. Thanks, George. This will be really useful, Sam said, smiling. George beamed and waved to Sam as he walked out the door. Then Sam paused and looked back at George. I have something that might be useful for our lower-level allies. It's useless for me now, but if you can find a way to mass-produce the effect, then it could be useful. Sam pulled out his brooch that he had earned by defeating the Sylvanian horror back in the tournament and tossed it to George. The man caught it dexterously, at odds with his large size. He grinned at Sam and vanished into a back room, presumably to tinker with the item. Sam left the smithy, and Rax walked along with him. Sam? Yes, Rax? Sam responded, knowing what the creature was about to say to him. What was that thing about after you left? You know, when you contacted me through our party link, and then said something strange? Yeah, uh, sorry about that. I had a decision that I needed a little bit of outside interference to answer. I know it might have been a bit rude though. You were the only person that I could think of to do it with though. Jeffrey might have been too busy, Sam responded, smiling awkwardly. Oh, that's all good. I was just confused. They wandered through the town amiably, and Sam took in the new buildings. Chapter 133 
he saw quite a few houses, all uniform in shape and size. They had been organized into neighborhoods, with most of the houses decorated with a certain color or symbol. The neighborhood that they were going through right now was colored red, and there was a star over each door. Every ten or so houses, there were special buildings, such as a restaurant, a bar, or some other utility building. These were filled with patrons who were on their downtime, and the noises of friendly conversation could be heard. Sam considered going into one to chat with some of the people, but after he saw everyone he passed salute him, he decided against it. Normally seeing a commander break bread with his men would increase morale, but in a situation like this where power was what stratified society and not merit, it would just be intimidating. He instead passed by the various taverns, with a doleful look on his face, instead acting as if he was surveying the town. Despite the convivial air and normal layout of the time, it was clear that this was a military base as well. Embankments of mana cannons and turrets lined the roads, and people went around dressed in utilitarian clothes, with weapons strapped to their backs or sides. Everyone was on high alert for the upcoming quest, and it was clear that there was an edge to everyone's attitudes. They acted normal enough, but they were all nervous. Upon seeing Sam, they became decidedly less so, but the anxiety came back as soon as he was out of sight. Sam couldn't blame them either. Even he was scared of what was to come. This would be what could utterly destroy any chances of Earth surviving this entire ordeal, cut off at the very beginning of its journey. What Sam hoped most of all was that the other two factions could see that it would be beneficial for them to work together, at least on some of the quests. The Seven Seals quest was clearly a faction-specific one, because only one person could create the ultimate weapon, but the other two ones were threats to humanity as a whole. Their survival might very well depend on if they could work together to defeat these threats. There was barely over a day left until it was to begin, and Sam was as ready as he could be, with all of his thresholds passed and his level as high as he could get it. The only other thing that he could do was to invest some skill tree points, but he didn't really have enough for anything that he really wanted. He was still trying to save up for that Dao resonance skill, and he was short by quite a bit. The last thing that he had still not done was to check if there had been any offers on his Dao fruit. He would not receive the money unless he was actually in the interweb and had seen the offer first. This was ostensibly to prevent thievery, but Sam suspected that it was a way for the system to regulate the traffic of items through the interweb. The system was very good at playing the benevolent godlike figure who only had the best interests of its charges in mind, but in reality, it was more akin to a parasite one that made it so that its host could not see the damage that was being done to it. When Sam had made a full circuit of the city, he made his way toward the city hall. There was a small house outside, which was unoccupied. Assuming that it was for him, Sam made his way inside and found a quiet place in which to enter the interweb. With Rax watching over him, Sam sank into the metaphysical realm. He came to his senses in the middle of the bazaar in which he had dealt with the alien faction who had hired him, and he made his way towards his stall. To Sam's surprise, there were dozens of ghostly figures hovering around it, each signifying an interested party. There was a floating line of text above the stall, which Sam read. Highest Offers The Talskarl Sect, 25, 000, 000 Credits Andar Mixtrin, 20, 000, 000 Credits and a One-Use Artifact the Sons of Danger, 15, 000, 000 credits. Chosue Balagon, 14, 000, 000 credits. Mansar the Great, 13, 000, 000 credits. The lower offers were all the same, a sum of credits that was a bit lower than the one above it. The only options that Sam was interested in were the first two. He made his way towards the brightest figures, and touched the one that corresponded to the Telskarl faction, first. A pre-recorded message played out of the figure's mouth. For your Dao fruit, we are willing to pay 25 million credits. If you find this acceptable, please assent to the trade. Sam moved over to the second one, and touched the hologram of Andar Mixthrin. You've already seen my monetary offer but I am sure that you are listening to this because of the reward that I left unknown. 
well, you are in luck. I am one of the foremost alchemists in this universal cluster, and I wish to buy that fruit off you. I will add one of my signature potions to the payment, a one-time use potion of resurrection. It only works up to the top of F rank, and it must be used within an hour of death, but that should work fine for you. Sam instantly accepted the offer. Such a potion, while apparently not that rare, was invaluable to him, as there was no way to get it otherwise. It would act as an extra life for himself or one of his friends, and that was worth more than five million credits to him. The sum of money was instantly transferred to his account, a small vial of iridescent liquid appeared in his hand, and his stall vanished. With his task fulfilled, Sam exited the interweb, and appeared back in his room with a smile on his face. He now held the vial in his hand, and it was slightly warm to the touch. It created an aura of comfort around it, but as to whether that was an effect of Sam knowing that his position was more secure now, or because it actually produced that effect, he did not know. Sam pocketed the vial, being extremely careful not to break it, especially considering that he was wearing metal armor, and walked out the door. There were small straps on the armor that he could use to carry stuff with, which was quite useful, and he found that a patch on his left side was very useful for placing potions in. If he ever found any more potions, then he could use this pocket for them. Sam and Rax made their way into the city hall, ready to inform the captains of what they had found. There were a few of them inside the building, Lau, Ava, and Claude. Sam walked up to them and smiled. That Dao fruit that I put up for auction finally paid off. Look what I got for it. Sam pulled the potion out of his pocket, handling it gingerly, and allowing the others to analyze it. They looked at him with confused expressions. Uh, all we're getting are question marks, Claude replied. Is this some sort of joke? Oh, yeah, that would happen. This is a high-tier potion, after all. No, this is not a joke. This potion is a one-use resurrection potion. If any of us die, it can be used to bring us back from the dead. It can only be used up to an hour after death though, Sam replied. Claude's eyes lit up with greed, while the other two smiled, happy that they had essentially gained a second chance for one of them. All three, no matter their reactions, could tell just how valuable this was, although it seemed that Claude was thinking about it in the monetary sense. Sam handed the potion to Lau, who gave him a look that expressed his confusion. Why are you giving this to me? Surely you should keep it safe? After all, you are the strongest among us. That's why I shouldn't keep something like this. I'm going to be getting into way more fights than the rest of you, and I can't risk this potion breaking. Out of everyone here, I trust you the most to guard this potion, Sam said, smiling at Lau. The other man took the potion with a curt nod, and infused it with his Tao briefly, before placing it into a pocket. Sam did not miss the way that Claude's eyes followed the potion as it was secreted away. Chapter 134 Ahem, Lau, can I talk to you for a moment? In private, Sam said after a moment's pause. Lau nodded and followed Sam into another room. So, you're wondering why I picked Claude as a captain, are you not? What dash Sam began. How did you know? Let me just say, old men have some tricks. No, seriously though, I sensed your intent through my Tao. Claude may seem untrustworthy, but I saw great honor in his past as I screened him for the captain position. He has an unfortunate tendency towards being secretive and he doesn't bother to keep his motives hidden, but I assure you that he is a good man. I swore not to tell anyone about his history, but trust me on this. Fine. But if he does start acting up. I assure you, I will be the first person to deal with it, Lau said, with a grin that told Sam that he was not expecting anything of the sort to happen. Sam nodded and left the room. Claude and Ava had already left, and it was just him in the hallway. Rax had gone off to do whatever the herpetopede did in his spare time, and Sam didn't have any reason to go looking for him. Instead, he sought out Eduardo. As Sam left the city hall, he called over a random passerby. Do you know where Eduardo, sorry, the angel of death is? Sam asked the woman. She looked extremely flustered to be speaking with him, but she still answered. 
Um, he's surveying the walls, sir. She immediately snapped off a salute, which Sam waved away. I wish everyone would stop saluting me. Makes me feel like some tin pot dictator in some banana republic. Yes sir, the woman said, completely ignoring what Sam had actually said. Sam sighed and left the woman, walking towards the walls. He took his time doing so, savoring the fresh air on his face and the lack of responsibility that had for the moment. At a brisk walk, which for him was like a run for a normal person, he reached the walls in about an hour. Eduardo was not there, but Sam ran a circuit of the walls until he had found the man. Eduardo was inspecting a turret on the walls, and he was tinkering around with it. Sam climbed up the stairs and made his way to him. Hey, Eduardo. I was told that you were working on the defenses. How are they going? I want to make sure that we're all prepared for the quest to come. Oh, Sam. You startled me. Uh, the defenses are going quite well. We have turrets every hundred feet, a mana cannon every thousand, as well as quite a few cannons within the city. As well as that we have the main mana cannon in the center of the city, Eduardo said. Sounds good. By the way, I recently came into a large pile of credits. Is there anything you could do with, uh, let's say 10 million credits? Eduardo perked up. Quite a lot of things actually. We could upgrade the walls and defenses, as well as soup up the big mana cannon. Doing so would allow us to take out any threat up to high F rank. That's good. Well, I'll transfer them into the city coffers then. The two men ran back to the city center, and Sam set up the Metropolis Corps for Eduardo to use. A few minutes later, the ground rumbled as multiple upgrades were completed across the city. A dull roar could be heard from the superior mana cannon, and Sam ran outside to look at it. The weapon had almost doubled in size, and a faint haze of light surrounded it. It was now taking in mana from the air around it, meaning that it would require far less outside input. Sam smiled as Eduardo followed him out. The other man whistled as he took in the new size of the cannon. Those three million credits that I spent on this weapon suddenly feel worth it now. Hang on, three million? Sam exclaimed. Why did it cost that much? Oh wait, I remember. Didn't the cannon itself cost 1.5 million? It makes sense that such an upgrade would cost double the amount. Sam walked over to the cannon and saw that there was a small screen on the bottom of it, displaying a few different numbers. Superior Mana Cannon Number 1 Charge 1350-250-000 mana. Charge per minute, 2500 mana. It would take the weapon about an hour and a 40 minutes to charge to full, so it would be ready to test soon enough, with plenty of time to recharge it for when it was really needed. Sam withdrew and gave Eduardo a wide smile. This seems really good. 250,000 mana is a lot of power to be directed into one attack. Keep up the good work. I'm going to get a final bit of cultivation in before all hell breaks loose. Sam left Eduardo, who was now pursuing the interface for the cannon. Sam walked straight over to the Dao tree, noticing that there was now a large fence around it. It had a scanner on the side, which looked like some sort of biometric lock. Sam walked up to it and studied it. As he approached, a familiar robot walked out from behind the tree. Halt. This is a restricted area. You need a time slot token for this. Wait, it's you. Never mind, Sarge said. Sarge? What are you doing here? What does it look like? I'm guarding this Dao tree. Seeing as nobody could keep up with me in a sparring match, they put me here instead. I haven't been bothered yet, so I've been doing a lot of thinking with my newly enhanced mental capacity. I found out some interesting things too. My body has become almost identical to that of a human, except for my appearance. Also, I can change that now too. Sarge's skin started to twist and warp, and then it snapped back into place. He had turned into a middle-aged man, with a long beard. A moment later, he was a woman, and then a boy. Shifting back to his normal form, Sarge smiled. Sam winced. 
he suddenly realized why the robot was so anatomically correct. Sarge, do you have any idea why you were given a gender and the ability to change your appearance? Of course, it is in my directives. It is to provide my master with quote a realistic training environment within all avenues of life, including the bedroom. Does that satisfy your question? Unfortunately, it does. Sam had no idea why he was being so prudish about the whole matter, but it just seemed strange to him that the robot could so effectively masquerade as a person, for such a purpose. Sam shrugged and walked up to the fence, before putting his finger on the scanner. It beeped green, and the gate opened, letting him in. There were a few people meditating around the tree, and he sat down with them. Upon seeing him, they tried to get up, but he told them to stay. They had earned their time here, and Sam had basically just walked in and took a place. He was not going to be the sort of leader who stole from his followers, for personal gain. As he sat down, the insights that he had been collecting slowly started to swirl around within his mind and he directed them towards his Tao. It began to glow a tiny amount as he channeled the power into it, and he soon sank into a rhythm of Tao cultivation. It was a mostly mindless task, as he had already collected the information that he needed, but it was one that was still somehow mentally taxing. Over the next few hours, he sat there in silence, not noticing as the other people came and went. There had been some sort of schedule set up with the Tao tree, and who could use it, and Sam's presence was surprising to the others. Of course, nobody complained, and Sam didn't pay any attention to them. Perhaps the fact that Sam had been using his Tao pedagogy skill to slightly boost their comprehension speed as a small sign of his gratitude had helped. He began to grow closer and closer to a breakthrough near the end, but something was stopping him from getting there. Some final unconscious insight that would catalyze his Tao vision, allowing him to reach the next level of his Tao. Unfortunately, that was not to be, and Sam was jostled out of his meditation by Sarge. Chapter 135 Everyone has been summoned to the city hall, for a last-minute speech. You are the only one who is not there. Sam jerked to his feet at the robot's words, his mind thankfully still clear, thanks to his high mental stats. Shit. When did it start? Why was I not notified? Sam said, mortified at the idea of being the one who was holding up proceedings. It only came up about an hour ago. The other captains wanted to give a final address, before everything kicks off. As to why you were not notified, I assumed that you had seen everyone else leave this area, but apparently not. Sam ignored the latter half of the robot's words, and ran towards the city hall. There was a faint hum of talking from inside the building and he ran towards the doors, opening them frantically. The noise was coming from the meeting hall, and Sam dashed there, entering it a few seconds later. As soon as he entered the room, everyone went silent. The entire faction, all two thousand plus of them, were waiting for him. He walked up to the front of the room, where the ten captains stood, and found the only open spot, the one behind the podium. Let's have a hand for our leader. Eduardo called out as soon as Sam had found his place, turning the minds of the crowd away from wondering what Sam had been doing, to greeting him. Sam waved back, and smiled weakly. Eduardo, apparently now the spokesman of the event, stepped forwards, and stood next to Sam. Now, the faction leader has some words that he would like to share with you about the trials to come, Eduardo said, suddenly stepping back, leaving Sam all alone to face the crowd. He gulped, and then suddenly quashed the feeling, his Dao surging within him. He had accomplished so much already, and he wasn't going to let something like fear of public speaking put him down. Utilizing his intelligence, he began to concoct a speech on the fly. Ladies and gentlemen, citizens of this city, and members of the Arbiters of Justice, welcome. As you all know, a series of great tribulations, greater than anything we have faced before, will be starting within a day. Three great threats loom over us, and for our sake, and the sake of Earth, we must prevail. The first of those threats is one that pits faction against faction, human against human. Seven great weapons have been placed around the world, and only one faction can unlock their true power. Secondly, a threat from a far more horrifying source hangs over us, that of the people who were previously seen as protectors. 
The armies of the world have united into a monstrosity of corruption and must be excised. Finally, the most dangerous threat of all, that of invasion, must be dealt with. Our universe may seem like an island, but it is not. Marauders from beyond our universe seek to plunder our resources, steal our hard-earned wealth. However, we will not let these come to pass. We shall beat back the other factions and unite Earth. We will exterminate the army of evil. We will show the rest of the multiverse that we are not to be messed with. Now, who's with me? Sam raised his fist, and the crowd erupted into cheers. Behind him, Jeffrey was looking at the back of Sam's head with a shocked look on his face. Sam sometimes projected an aura of simplicity, but he was anything but. Sam smiled broadly as he took in the effect that his words had. He had just boosted the morale of the faction members by a significant amount by his speech. The subtle application of his aura, imbued with his Tao, also had helped, but nobody had to know about that. The grin that Lao was flashing at Sam told him that the man had sensed the aura, but nobody else had done so, it seemed. Sam withdrew from the podium and Eduardo walked up. Now that you have gathered here, it's time for one last feast, before the end times come. Eat and drink like there's no tomorrow, for there very well might now be. An army of serving robots surged into the room, carrying trays loaded with food and drinks. A warm glow of companionship shortly suffused the room, and Sam walked over to Jeffrey as the party went into full swing. You were pretty shocked at that speech, weren't you, Jeffrey? Sam said with a cheeky smile. The other man nodded. For the life of me, I thought that you were only good at smashing things with that mace of yours, Jeffrey answered, with a grin of his own. Also, that's an interesting fashion choice, the man said, pointing at Sam's armor. Yeah, it seemed fitting seeing as we are soon going to be having the fight of our lives. Now, Sam, I have a few friends that I want to introduce you to, Jeffrey said, pulling on Sam's arm. Sam followed the man, reasonably sure that he knew where this was going. As they exited the room, Sam became sure. Jeffrey, you better not be trying to get me to participate in some sort of orgy. I know your inclinations. Sam, come on. By the looks of you, you've never had real fun in your life. Fun that only a certain type of companionship can provide. It was at that moment that Rack sidled up. Where are you two going? The herpotopede said. Uh, the bathrooms, both of them said, only succeeding in making the purpose of their trip sound even stranger. That's where you humanoids fulfill your bodily functions, right? Uh, yes, Rax, but can we go please? Sam here is dying to go, Jeffrey said, with a pained smile on his face. The lizard nodded and walked down the hallway and away from them. Then the conversation resumed. Did you just call me a virgin? Sam said, realizing what Jeffrey had implied. Are you one? Damn it. Yes. Wait, really? Jeffrey said. I'm sorry for your loss, Sam. However, you have a chance to make it all up tonight. What do you say to have a little bit of fun? Thus began a night that Sam would later forcibly excise from his mind. That was not to say that it wasn't fun, but halfway through the night, Jeffrey had gotten more than a little bit drunk, and had decided to switch back to his bird form. Seeing what was basically a giant chicken furry engaging in inappropriate acts, with multiple people at the same time was something that Sam did not wish to remember. Even worse, the others seemed to have wanted him to do so. It seemed that there were quite a few deviants in his faction. As long as they could fight however, Sam was fine with that. Sam had kept himself sober through the night, in order to make sure that he was ready for the morning to come. As the dawn broke, and the sun crested the horizon, the world trembled. Chapter 136 Sam jumped to his feet upon feeling this, causing the various drunken hedonists lying around him to groan in dismay. Taking a deep breath, Sam shouted, waking them all up from their slumber. They got up reluctantly, but luckily the effects of alcohol were far reduced on people of their level. There would be no hangover, only annoyance. Beyond the wall, something walked, and its steps caused the ground to shake. Sam could briefly make out what looked like a gargantuan head peering over the walls. 
A moment later something slammed into them, and a cloud of dust rose up. Sam leaped out the window and started running towards the wall, thankful that his armor could equip itself. The captains and stronger members of the faction came running after him, and they reached the wall a few minutes later. Outside the wall, the noise of stomping feet could be heard, and Sam bolted up the stairs. Outside was a sight far worse than anything Sam had expected. Tens of thousands of aliens milled around and they were all heavily armed, and quite highly leveled. In the middle of the army, ten people stood, each projecting the aura of a high G-rank fighter. In the very center of their number, a man stood. His skin was a reddish color and he had two curling ram's horns, protruding from both sides of his head. He was undoubtedly an F-rank warrior. Sam could feel the concentrated power rolling off him in waves, seeking to suppress him. Every mile or so, there was a juggernaut of twisted flesh and metal that seemed to be some sort of division of siege engines. They looked like ogres, only far larger, and without a scrap of intelligence in their eyes. They were simply tools and nothing more. Sam stared down at the man, feeling a trace of fear for the first time in a while. Upon seeing this, the demonic figure laughed, a fierce and high-pitched noise that caused Sam to grit his teeth. You will give us your Tao tree to us this instant, or we shall be forced to attack. Upon my name, Salvar Tenebron, I swear that if you do not hand it over, you will all die painful deaths. If you do, then your end shall be quick. What do you say? The alien leader said, in a deep and sonorous voice that somehow reached Sam without sounding like a shout. Sam growled and stepped forwards. His fists were burning with the energy of his Tao. The energy of righteous anger was filling his body, and he felt this soul stirring within him. All traces of his previous fear were gone, and he only felt rage. I have two words for you, you bastard. Fuck you. Sam screamed across the battlefield. Salvar roared and raised his axe. His army charged, roaring war cries. People dashed to the turrets and started firing into the army. Sam stood there glaring down at his enemy, the red alien snarling up at him. Raising his mace, Sam screamed wordlessly, before leaping down into the fray. In the Overlord's faction headquarters. The Overlord shouted in rage as his cameras picked up a horde of aliens gathering on both sides of the canyon. The walls that he had erected on the sides were doing a good job of keeping them out, but that was more because they hadn't tried to breach them than because of their structural durability. The overlord himself was manning their superior mana cannon, which had been souped up to the max half of the entire wealth of the faction had gone to upgrading this weapon, and he was looking forward to using it. The weaker members of his faction, who were seen as cannon fodder, charged up the ramps on the side of the canyon towards the top, ready to throw themselves off the walls and into the enemy army. As the overlord's inner circle gathered around him, he fired the weapon. A new star was born on the end of the cannon, and it arced up into the air. The automatic targeting system of the cannon made sure that it headed directly into the greatest concentration of enemies. A moment later a pillar of light shot up into the air from beyond the wall. The ground shook, and a light mist of blood rained down on the people in the canyon. The overlord barked out a short laugh and then started running towards the walls. His new power from having passed every threshold was now coming to bear, and he sped up the ramps like a man possessed. He was now on the road to Zenith, and he would not let some aliens get in his way. By the time that he had reached the top, he was able to see the true scale of the enemy army. There were thousands of aliens waiting there, and there were even a few people around the overlord's strength. None of that mattered however. An army of this size would allow him to exponentially increase his power through his collection of Tao energy from killing off the weaklings. By the time that he got to the leaders, he would be so strong that they would die as soon as he touched them. With a bellow of excitement and rage, the overlord soared over the enemy lines, landing in a crater of cracked earth. The second strongest man on earth was here to play, and more than a few things were going to be broken. Kane City. Rodney Kane growled as his surveillance system picked up the hordes of aliens crowding around his city. They were here for his resources, and he would not let them have them. He crushed the computer screen between his fingers and started to suit up in his dark armor. 
with a whoosh of air, his greatsword manifested. He had not been idle in the last few days, despite his bitter rage, and he had grown in power. With one level left to go until he had completed his final threshold, which some strange force was telling him to do, Rodney was as ready as he could be to fight against the filth that dared to despoil his planet. He stomped out of the repurposed nightclub that he was using as a base, and all around him, his followers gathered. Rodney looked around him for Andrew Monroe, but the man was nowhere to be seen. The two men had started to drift apart, and as far as Rodney knew, Andrew was already gone. Well, that was all good. He had no need for such a treacherous ally. He would beat these pieces of scum into the ground, and teach them not to mess with him and his faction. With a grinding roar, the gates of the city opened, and a storm of artillery fire was directed out into the enemy lines. As Rodney and his retinue charged, a fierce smile creased his face. This was where he would prove himself once and for all. In the ruins of Paris. Reaper trudged through the muck and decay that coated the floor of the extensive catacombs that twisted and turned underneath the city, a dark model of the streets overhead. He felt at home here among the dead, and he was slowly but surely gaining elemental mastery from just being here. Behind him a line of skeletons and race walked and floated along the endless hallways. Reaper had been given the option of following his own path by the system, and he had gladly taken it. He would make a faction of the unliving, a necrotic kingdom of the dead. And when they surfaced from the dark places of the earth, all would fall silent and still, unmarred by the odious noise of life. Book 1 Epilogue the storm that had been caused by the initialization of Earth's universe had only begun to build in strength. Across the surrounding sector, factions began to make their moves, hoping to get a foothold within the universe. Most failed before they had even begun, threatened into abandoning their course of action by the forces of Tantalos. However, there were two factions that had already entered the universe, and were too strong for Tantalos to protest. Both the prophets of the Machine God and the Minori sect had set their eyes upon that universe, and nothing short of an edict from the Creator Kings themselves would deter them from their goal. On the Worldship Brutality Baltus Agrinor was more ecstatic than he had been in a long time. His higher-ups had commended him upon his contact with Reaper. Too bad that Salvinius Relk was not around anymore to dispute his claim of having found the man first. Not that anyone would have believed him anyway, seeing as Baltus was of a higher rank than him. However, just to be safe, Baltus had exiled Salvinius from the universe, and forced him to sign a contract to never reveal the true accounts of what had happened. Baltus took a deep breath of the various hallucinogens around himself, and sunk into a vision of delightful torture. The mind-altering substances that were manufactured by the Alchemists' Guild, and other, more unsavory, factions were quite potent and the rules of space and time did not apply to those imbibing them. Baltus was both being tortured and torturing someone else at the same time, doubling the rate at which he was able to cultivate his Tao. For foul deviant cultivators like the Minorian sect, such elixirs were more than just entertainment, they were a legitimate cultivation resource. After an interminable time of this, Baltus awoke and prepared to get to business. Shuddering with the aftereffects of the drug still coursing through him, Baltus got up out of his spike-lined chair and tidied himself up. As much as he liked pain, he didn't want to suffer what one of his superiors would do if he showed up untidy. This worldship was one of the uncountable number that the sect possessed, and each of them could contain tens of billions of people. On the other hand, they could also be filled to the brim with weaponry. This was one of the ships that was used for taking care of recalcitrant galaxies within the bounds of a sect-owned universe. Powered by a supermassive black hole, almost all of the worldship was uninhabitable, within the black hole's event horizon, but the outer layers were relatively safe. The gravity there was a good hundred times stronger than it would have been on a normal planet of that size, but that was inconsequential to people like Baltus. As to the weaker inhabitants, well that was their own problem, for being so weak. The main weapon of the worldship, a cannon powered by the black hole and guided by the Tao energy of a high D rank cultivator, could wipe out solar systems in the blink of an eye. This particular worldship had a long history of violence, hence its name, and was under the control of Baltus' direct overseer, 
who, as was in vogue for more powerful cultivators, had chosen a Tao name instead of a normal one. His name was Eternal Pain, and he strived to make his actions speak for themselves. His exploits of butchery and sadism were legendary within the universe, which was why Baltus was so apprehensive about meeting with him. He had submitted his plan of attack for converting Reaper to their cause a few days ago, and it had taken until now for eternal pain to get back to him about the matter. Baltus took a hard right and entered one of the many flight channels that crisscrossed the ship, built for the purpose of allowing stronger cultivators to move at full speed, or as close to that as they could get with the enhanced gravity, and therefore traverse the ship with ease. He flew down this particular flight path, deep into the bowels of the ship. Eternal Pain had set up his command station as close as possible to the black hole, in order to prove his power over all others. As he approached, coasting down the borehole, Baltus began to feel a slight pain as the gravity increased. By the time that he had exited into the meeting chamber that he had been heading to, his body was under extreme pressure. However, he quelled it and began to prepare for his meeting. Baltus Agrinor, my lowly slave. Welcome to my abode. I hope that it is comfortable for you. The terrifying voice of a high D ranker echoed out from the center of the room, and a man emerged from the shadows. His voice was purposely empowered by his Tao, making it resound like it was in an echo chamber. His body was covered in a litany of scars, and his face was an almost unrecognizable mass of deformed flesh. However, his aura was enough to render these features almost inconsequential. A wild storm of energy that could only be described as serrated emanated out from him. Baltus' skin started to tear under the force, but he was powerful enough to mostly ignore it. Yes, my lord. Most comfortable indeed, Baltus said, before pulling out a knife and slitting his skin to show his loyalty to his lord. Despite his ability to also enhance his voice, he did not dare to do so. It would have been a sign of ultimate disrespect. Good. You are here to hear my verdict, I presume? After long deliberation, I have tentatively decided to accept your plan of action, with one change. Rather than poach Reaper from underneath the nose of the butcher, we will allow him to stay on his planet, but we will also support him in his efforts. I bow to your superior wisdom, my lord, and am eternally grateful for your acceptance of my plan. It shall be enacted at once. Baltus bowed again and fled up the borehole, out of the gravity well. Behind him, Eternal Pain smiled, his scars twisting into disturbing shapes. In Prophet Outpost Zeta 35 On a lonely moon, orbiting the core of a failed star, one of the many outposts of the prophets of the machine god stood. Most of the moon was entirely taken up by the central processing unit of the moon's governing AI, but the surface was mostly free and open for inhabitants, by organic creatures. Most of the people living on the moon, about a million of them, were simple workers, there to maintain the functions of the compound that the AI, lacking a body, could not do. As part of the balancing act that the prophets maintained in order to make sure that organic beings and AIs operated in concert banned artificial intelligence from inhabiting more than one robotic body at a time. Of course, that body could be immensely powerful, but so could any organic being as well. Besides, the construction of any body beyond the equivalent power of an E-rank would be prohibitively expensive. In the entire organization, there were far more organics that had reached that level than artificial intelligences. The AI that ran this outpost was part of a hive mind network that fed information directly into the Supreme Overmind, the leader of the artificial intelligence half of the organization. More importantly, it was the AI that was in control of Andrew Monroe. Recently, it had been acting up, but nobody among the many researchers on the moon could figure out why. One of the lower rank members of the organization scurried out of her dormitory that she shared with the other assistants to the planetary overseer. They all served underneath the warden of the AI, an older man who had extended his lifespan exponentially through the use of highly advanced reagents and potions. Nobody knew exactly how old he was, only that he had been on this moon as long as living memory. The woman activated her built-in rocket function to fly across the moon's surface and towards the monolithic obsidian tower that protruded up from the moon's surface, tens of miles into the air. This was a monitoring station for the AI, 
allowing it to sense what was happening outside of the moon's core. It took her about an hour to reach the tower. She had been summoned there by the caretaker of the AI, for a reason that she did not know. All that she knew was that when the caretaker called, it was important. As she jetted across the barren wastes of the moon, she kept her eyes on the tower. Her augmented eyesight and other technological enhancements started to pick up various things in the air around her, but she ignored them. She followed the apostate path of the progression, meaning that she eschewed the workings of the system for pure technological prowess. There were other paths, the rest of whom used the system to some extent. Of course, all of them believed that they were the one true path. As she approached the tower, a small gate opened on the side, and she flew in. The gate closed behind her, and she could just about make out a wizened old man walking towards her from the end of the hallway. He carried some strange mass of metal and tubing in his hands that pulsated every few seconds. The woman saluted him as he approached. Overseer. What did you summon me here for? The older man smiled weakly and kept walking. Overseer? I am truly sorry for this, young one, but the overmind demands it. He sped up so quickly that it appeared as if he had teleported, appearing in front of the woman in the blink of an eye. He pressed the contraption to her chest, and blinding pain enveloped her, causing the women to black out. The overseer watched as the construction of metal wormed its way into her body, healing the wounds as it made its way in. What he was doing now was deeply illegal under the laws of his faction, but when the overmind demanded something, everyone save for its living counterpart had to scurry to obey. A few minutes later, it was done, and the woman opened her eyes. They were pitch black, but they quickly shifted back to their normal green color. The overseer bowed to the woman as she rose. Greetings, Zeta 35. How is your new body? This is, different. It feels strange to be within a meat suit. Is this how you people live your lives? Unfortunately, yes. Now, have you dismantled your host? The faction enforcers will come knocking if they detect that you are present within two hosts at the same time. The woman's face twisted into a grotesque approximation of a smile. Of course. Are you sure that this will work? Will this body shield my processing unit from scanners? Absolutely. I have been raising the assistant here to be perfect hosts their entire life. It meant that they could never progress far in power, but they are perfect for your means. Is the plan clear? Yes. I will infiltrate the universe with our asset in it under this disguise, with the intent of discovering why it has been acting up. If salvage is unattainable, then I will eliminate it. Finally, if the system or the planetary inhabitants get wind of my presence, I will activate the Omega Protocol and erase all traces of my existence. The overseer nodded and did not speak another word. The AI host flew off towards a teleportation station near the top of the tower. Now that the new universe was open for invasion, anyone under a certain level could enter it, for a fee of course. With one final look back, it entered the portal and disappeared. Behind it, the overseer shed a single tear. He had done what he had done for the greater good of his faction, but sacrificing one of his students grated on him. Sinking back into his guise of a harmless old man, the overseer leaned on his cane as he walked off towards his quarters. This would be what made or broke his reputation among the other prophets. He only hoped that the AI would succeed. With the encroachment of two different B-rank factions imminent, Earth was in for a rough time, especially considering the fact that it was still being initialized. In fact, this was a sector record for how quickly a new universe had attracted the attention of the greater factions. Whether that would be a good thing or a bad thing, only time would tell. Chapter 137 Sam laughed out loud as he landed among the alien army, in a crater of blood and devastation. The head of his mace spoke loud and clear for him, leaving trails of carnage where it went. His Tao was crystal clear upon this course of action, and he would not deny it. These people had come here to ransack his planet, kill its people, and despoil its image. Sam would not stand for that. He locked eyes with the enemy general, who smirked at Sam. Before Sam could do anything, the man jumped up into the air, 
landing on a small floating disc. It streaked off into the sky, vanishing shortly afterwards. Sam was dumbstruck by what he had just seen. Could it have been that the demonic man had been scared of them? No, that was not it. For this to be the entire invasion force seemed quite unlikely to Sam. He doubted that Tantalos would allow just anyone into his universe after all, no matter what the system might espouse. If Sam was to make a guess, he would say that only the factions that could strong-arm Tantalos into caving into their demands were being allowed to send troops in, and they were limited in the power of said troops. Still, this was probably only the tip of the iceberg in relation to how many invaders had arrived on Earth. This was most likely a way to test the power of Sam's faction. Well, he would not hold back. This entire time, Sam had been casually eviscerating and pulping aliens left and right, causing streams of exotically colored blood and flesh to fly everywhere. His mace acted like a scythe as it reaped the souls of these pitifully weak opponents. They were all over level 30, but compared to an elite like Sam, they were like infants, if not even less. Well come on then, you pieces of shit. Sam screamed, fielding his aura for the first time. It exploded out of him like a tidal wave of red energy, causing some of the weaker enemies to seize up with pure terror. Behind him, his captains who had entered the fray followed suit, and a wall of solid aura force merged together, washing over the enemy ranks. Some of them tried to flee then and there, but were stopped by the recalcitrant lines standing behind them. With a grim smile, Sam advanced. Behind him, he heard the bear roar as he transformed into his suit of rocky armor, which had grown even larger over the last few days as the man had refined it. The man whose name Sam had still not learned, although he was fairly certain that he was Pyotr Nikolaevich, the name that he had seen in Barigis' office, bounded forwards and smashed his rock-covered fist into the, the ground, causing a wave of earth to ripple outwards. Eduardo leaped forwards and slashed out with his rapier, bisecting dozens of fighters in one go. The gap in power between Sam's elites and the enemy fighters was almost scary. However, it was not to last. More powerful aliens, each looking like some sort of leader figure, charged forwards and engaged the captains in battle. Eduardo was matched up with a live alien who wielded a multi-tailed flail, which was not ideal to face with a rapier. Sam still had faith in the man however. The bear was bowled over by a stocky brute who had four arms, each of which was covered in metal armor that had spikes on the knuckles. Some of the captains had not reached the battlefield yet, and some of them were fighting from the battlements, raining down spells and elemental attacks on the enemies. Solitaire was surrounded by a cloud of floating cards that he would send flying out every few seconds. The effects were far weaker than the ones that he had used during his fight in the tournament, but they were far more rapid, and they did not drain him. Because of these cards, interesting effects came to life around the battlefield, creating small mushroom clouds of fire, strange constructions of light and metal, and even objects that looked like life force siphons that absorbed red energy from nearby aliens and then detonated with the force of a small bomb. Strangely enough, nobody tried to attack Sam. They all knew him for what he was, and the only person who could have stood against him was the F-rank warrior who had fled earlier. Sam was left to his own devices, and he looked around the battlefield for the most pressing threat. Noting that the behemoth ogres were battering the walls, Sam began running towards the nearest one. As it saw him coming, it let out a dull roar swinging down with one mighty fist. It came slowly, allowing Sam to dodge it, but when it landed the earth shook and a crater was formed beneath it. Sam jumped up onto its arm and ran up the limb, smiling as he saw the look of puzzlement that slowly came over the ogre. Sam leaped up as the ogre swatted at him with its free hand, using the limb as a springboard to get to its head. Sam hovered in the air above the ogre for a moment, and then he brought his mace down with him as gravity took hold. The ogre's neck telescoped into itself, and cracks spread out from where its feet touched the ground. Blood spurted out from its shattered vertebrae, and it fell backwards slowly, looking up at Sam with a slack-jawed expression. He jumped off at the last moment, and started running towards the next ogre. He was confident in his captain's ability to defend themselves without him. The next behemoth was slamming its fists into one of the gates, and small cracks were spreading across it. 
Sam gritted his teeth and redoubled his pace, streaking across the ground. By the time that he reached the ogre, he was a blur of motion, and the hundreds of aliens surrounding him looked as if they were standing still. There was truly no comparison between Sam and the aliens. He could have dismantled the entire army by himself, or at least a large fraction of it. Sam pulled his mace back, and then smashed it into the ogre's right leg as he came barreling in. All of his momentum was transferred into his mace, and the ogre's leg exploded outwards. It fell sideways, grunting, and Sam jumped up into the air, flipping multiple times as he rose, and then bringing down his mace onto the ogre's head. The head exploded like a ripe melon, showering the ground with gore. The nearby aliens shouted an alarm and started running. They were weak enough to view the ogre as an insurmountable threat. For Sam, to have casually dealt with it like that would mean that they were even further above him. Sam sent a wave of aura pressure after them, and their pace redoubled. Being strong was very fun. Right now, the only real threats were the ogres and the enemy leaders. A rain of turret fire streaked over his head as he ran, impacting the aliens. By this point it was basically just a slaughter. A few of the weaker faction members had left the bounds of the compound, and were now harrying the disorganized soldiers as they ran. This was like a goldmine of essence for lower-leveled fighters. Sam would probably not even gain a single level from this, but the level 30s and lower would probably be able to gain multiple levels. Sam's mace glowed as he filled it with his Tao energy, and his next target, another ogre, only had a moment to look up before its skull was caved in by Sam's mace. His good mood was starting to vanish at this point. None of these enemies were a good challenge for him, and all that was happening was that he was wasting his time mopping them up. He slowly came to realize that seeing his brutal slaughter of these weaker enemies as a good thing was a path that gradually sloped down into the darker recesses of sin. No, he could take pleasure in slaying the wicked, but he should not extend that to being stronger than his enemies. He did not want to end up like Berigius, or even Tantalos, completely filled with such a sense of superiority that others were just tools, or even worse, sources of power. Sam's Tao might evolve in the future, far past his current one, but the nuggets of truth that were contained within the concept of justice would be ones that stuck with him forever. The multiverse was stuck in an endless cycle of pain and suffering, because of the depredations of the powerful. Seeing as nobody else seemed up to the task, Sam would be the one who cleansed it. Chapter 138 With these heavy thoughts in mind, Sam butchered his way through the remaining ogres, finishing a full circuit of the walls within about an hour, leaving massive corpses dotting the land around it. He ignored most of the alien soldiers, letting them flail ineffectively against the walls they were soon wiped from existence, by turret fire anyway. The turrets were quite potent for how weak they were, but an average level 30 fighter with no titles was only a few times stronger than a normal person. Both would still die to a giant ballista bolt punching a hole in their head. Besides, these turrets were built with system-enhanced beings in mind. The ranks gradually thinned, and eventually someone within the walls had had enough of waiting. There was a colossal bang, and a car-sized blob of amorphous power shot over the walls and into the thickest section of the enemy lines. A shockwave of power erased them from existence, and created a crater a hundred feet wide and twenty feet deep. The surrounding kilometer of land was blasted by hurricane-force winds and a wave of searing heat, and Sam felt a gust tousel his hair, despite the fact that he was well out of the radius. More than a thousand of the enemy soldiers had died in that one attack, and Sam could guess at its origin. The superior mana cannon. He was going to have a serious conversation with whoever had used that without permission. As he ran, he walked through which of the captains he had seen outside. Only they were allowed to use the main cannon, and from what Sam could tell, it was most likely Claude who had done it. The man was not present on the walls or on the ground, and he seemed like the type too. Sam did not let his suspicion blind him however, and he decided to withhold judgment until he got a better sense of what had happened. He realized that he was already back where he had begun, but most of the fighters there had already moved on. Sam smiled as he saw the corpses of the enemy elites lying on the ground. They had not been able to withstand the might of his captains. 
Off in the distance, he saw the bear chasing down a small group of aliens as they attempted to flee. The body count for this fight was going to be very high, and as far as Sam could tell, none of them were from his side. In any case, his presence was no longer needed here. Sam made his way to a nearby gate, hailed the guard above it, and entered the compound. It was time to get to the bottom of who had fired the cannon. Sam ran towards the city hall, his face grim. Maybe he was being a bit overzealous, but lives were at stake here. He reached the city hall fifteen minutes later, barging in the door. On the way there, he had seen that there had been nobody manning the cannon, which made sense. There was no reason for anyone to have fired the cannon and then remained there. When he entered the meeting hall, hearing the faint sound of a person breathing, he was greeted with a very confusing sight. Two clods laid on the ground, both of them heavily injured, and one of them unconscious. Upon seeing Sam, the one who was awake, smiled. Good, you're finally here. Then he collapsed, and went still. Sam rushed over, and noticed a bracelet on the wrist of one of the figures, the one who had been unconscious when he had entered. Sam recognized that bracelet. It was the same type of bracelet that Jeffrey had worn to conceal his identity. With a growing sense of panic, Sam pulled it off. The skin of the fake clod started to shift and turn green, and two arms appeared out of thin air, hidden from sight by the effects of the bracelet. It had been an imposter, a fake clod sent here to sow discord. That was not what had caused Sam to feel alarm however. If one alien had gotten in, then there could be many more. Sam picked up the real clod, and carried him out of the city hall. The fake one could stay put for now. It didn't look like he was moving any time soon. Just to be sure however, Sam broke both of the alien's legs with his mace. There could be no mercy in dealing with someone who threatened his faction in such an existential way. By this point, the enemy army outside had fled, and he could see the figures of the defenders coming back to the city. They would be very surprised when they saw what he had to show them. Eduardo reached him first, as the captain with the highest level of dexterity. Upon seeing Claude, he frowned. What happened to Claude? There was an imposter. It's kind of hard to explain. For now, I need to get Claude to the hospital. Where is the nearest one? As they stood there talking, Lau came streaking in, riding on the back of the bear. No need, the elderly man said. I can heal him. His injuries should be within my abilities. I will need some life force though. Between you three, there should be enough. Are you all willing to do this? All three men nodded, and Lao jumped off the bear's back. He closed his eyes, and a gentle pulse of blue light enveloped all five of them. Sam felt his strength fading away suddenly. It was a strange feeling, but one that was dangerously painless. There was no warning that he was having his life force drained, only a minor feeling of tiredness. That feeling soon heightened, and Eduardo fell over after a minute. The bear and Sam held on until it was done however, but by the end both men were sweating heavily and could barely prevent themselves from collapsing. Lau took a deep breath and pressed his palms to Claude's chest. The man took a shuddering gasp of a breath and opened his eyes. Wah, where am I? He began, stuttering slightly. You're safe. You were injured from fighting with that alien who was pretending to be you, but it seemed that you won the fight, Sam said, helping the other man to his feet. Claude clutched his head, trying to remember something. A moment later, he nodded. Yes. I don't remember much, but I remember a hooded figure approaching the mana cannon. I went towards them to challenge them but when the figure turned around, I saw myself. I knew that nobody here could do anything like that, and they had no reason to do so either, so that must mean that it was an invader. I engaged the alien in battle, I don't remember anything else after that. Did you deal with them? Claude said. Yeah, they're waiting in the city hall. I broke their legs so they couldn't escape, Sam said, awaiting judgment from the others for his actions. All he got were smiles. Good, that will make this much easier then, Eduardo said. Sam nodded. It seemed that he had made the right decision after all. 
using the opinions of those around you was not a great barometer for virtue, but he trusted these people, and they had shown themselves time and time again to be honorable. If they thought that something was the right thing to do, then as far as Sam was concerned, it was. Chapter 139 Claude took a moment to recover, and they all walked towards the city hall. By then the rest of the captains had made their way there, and Sam briefly explained what had happened to Claude as they walked. So you remembered what my bracelet looked like, and were able to pick out the real Claude like that? I believe a little bit of praise is in order, Geoffrey said, laughing. When I caught you with that bracelet, I was going to blast you back to kingdom, come, for being an alien. If that failed, then I would have probably killed you some other way. It should be me that you're thinking, Sam replied, smiling. The others frowned and re-evaluated Jeffrey. Wait, there's something that I'm missing here. What exactly happened between you two before the tournament? Lau asked, looking between Sam and Jeffrey. I'll tell you later. Let's deal with the more pressing problem first, Sam declared, walking a little bit faster. By the time that they reached the city hall, the alien had woken up and was in the process of crawling out of the building. Sam walked over slowly and picked it up by the scruff of its neck. He was unable to tell the gender of the alien. It had an androgynous face and seemed to not have normal human biology. Of course, the four arms were a dead giveaway that this was not exactly the most similar of aliens to humans. It spat at him bitterly as he picked it up shooting a small glob of bluish phlegm at Sam that missed him, but splattered on the ground, burning a hole in it. Sam raised an eyebrow. Huh, acidic spit. Now, who exactly are you? He asked, shaking the alien a bit. I will never tell you, scum. Such a creature as you is beneath me. I am a proud warrior of the Calvan people, and I will never betray their name, the alien said. A moment later, everyone started laughing. Seriously? Just how skewed are your stats? Sam asked, grinning. Maybe consider investing a few more points into intelligence next level up. The alien realized what it had done, and growled. It was too late however. Jeffrey, do you know who the Calvan are? Sam asked. Eh, vaguely. I remember one of them coming to the palace during a trade meeting. I remember it because that was one of my great-uncle Fallon's greatest victories. The entire race is quite low in intelligence, it seems. I have no idea why a member of the Calvan would be sent on a mission like this though. How dare you besmirch the name of my ancestors? The alien screamed, struggling mightily. It was actually quite strong, causing Sam to readjust his grip. It was clear where all of those lost intelligence points had gone. He smacked it lightly, which ended up rocking the alien's head from side to side. It glared up at him from the side of its eyes, and Sam shook his head. Is there a prison here, or somewhere to keep this spy? Sam asked. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there is a minor holding facility on the other side of the city. We built it in case something like this happened. It can only fit one person, but that's all we need. For a proper prison, we would have needed someone with experience as a warden, which we lack, Solitaire answered. Oh. Well, that seems fine. I'll take it there. Can the rest of you check the city for any more imposters? It doesn't matter how you do it, just make sure that we are safe. Sam ran off, holding the alien under his arm as it struggled futilely. With its broken legs, each motion inflicted great pain on it, which discouraged it from struggling too hard. Sam ran through the grid of streets that segmented the rapidly growing city, and saw a few people going around and doing everyday things. Things that didn't really fit in with the monster-filled world that they lived in now. People were hanging out laundry to dry, going to buy groceries, even just chatting with each other on the sides of roads. This city was slowly becoming an oasis among the chaos, and Sam smiled. Perhaps, after all of this was over, Earth could be repopulated again. However, that was just a naive dream. Once the system had arrived, Earth had been irrevocably changed. There would be no going back from this. Every future generation would be born into the system, and would have to learn how to fight for their lives. There was one silver lining however. 
If people continued to level up, then their lifespans would increase quickly enough for them to be able to live for far longer than any pre-system human had. Perhaps Sam would see this bright future for himself. In any case, the most likely cause of his death was battle, and not old age, as long as he continued leveling up like this. Eventually, he might even become immortal. Sam didn't know what rank that happened at, only that such a thing existed. Sam ran the last stretch of the way as he felt the struggles of the alien intensify. It was beginning to heal somewhat, and Sam wanted to drop it off, before it recovered. A small, squat stone building stood at the end of a row of houses, and it had no windows. This was most definitely what Sam was looking for. He dashed over to it, and opened the door with his fingerprint. It was keyed to him and the captain's, and it slid open smoothly. Inside was a sparsely furnished room, with a bed, a toilet, and a table. He set the alien down on the bed and ran out the door, before closing it tightly, and making sure that it was locked. He took his time walking back to the city hall, wanting to give his captains plenty of time to finish their search before he arrived. With this in mind, Sam took a long and meandering path through the city, stopping in a small alehouse along the way. There were only a few people inside, which is why he had entered. If there had been more than a few, then it might have incited a stampede. The thing was, the city was far larger than the number of inhabitants required, and therefore most of the establishments within it were either empty, or only had a few people in them. A city that was ten miles in diameter was not that large, but it was very large for a mere 2,500 people. Sam walked up to the bar, and noticed that the bartender was trembling slightly. Look, if it makes this easier, I'm off duty, okay? Sam said. The trembling did not ease in the lightest. Anyway, I'll take a pint of your best ale. The other man nodded wordlessly, and slid a large glass cup over to a spigot on the wall. A stream of frothy pale ale came out, and filled the cup to the brim. Shaking slightly as he brought the cup over, the man saluted. It was one thing seeing Sam from afar, but actually pouring a drink from him was something else entirely. Sam didn't really like the hero worship that most of the people in this town had for him, but it was inevitable. Sam smiled at the man, and sat down. Taking a long pull from his tankard, he sighed. It was some seriously good beer. One of the benefits of the system was that professionals and non-combat classes became extremely good at their craft as they leveled up. This brewer here could make beer far more refreshing than anything that humanity could have hoped to make before. By the time that he reached F rank, he could probably mass-produce it as well. Sam realized that he was staring at the man as he thought about the future of the city, and the other man looked extremely unnerved. Sam averted his eyes, and the other man scurried away clearly glad to have escaped. The other people in the room gave Sam one last look, and left as well, leaving him there to drink in peace. Sighing, Sam left as well. There was no fun in being on his own in a bar. Gone were the days when he could just hang out and relax with his buddies. Actually, who the hell am I kidding? I never had any of those, as I sure didn't ever have time to relax, Sam thought bitterly. It was true. In his relatively short life before the system, filled with tragedy and woe, moments of true happiness were few and far between. Now however, it was different. If Sam had a choice to forsake the system for his old life, he would have refused. Of course, that would have been the right thing to do, seeing as it would have saved billions of people, and his Tao would likely have forced him to do so, but luckily that was just a hypothetical. In any case, would his Tao make a choice that led to its own destruction? That was actually a good question. Seeing as there was probably a concept, and therefore a Tao, of self-destruction, or something along those lines, there had at least been a few people who must have experienced it. It was yet another question to add to his list for his next delving session into the interwebs. For now, it was time for him to check on the progress of the others in finding any impostors. Chapter 140 Sam wondered briefly as he walked about whether Jeffrey would lend him his disguise bracelet. If it was a device that was keyed to a specific body, then it would be useless, as going into public as one of the captains was only marginally worse than going out as himself. If it worked differently however, 
then Sam would finally be able to interact with his people. Sam spotted Lau and Eduardo returning to the city hall together. The others were not in sight, but the two men spotted him and waved him over. Find anything? Sam asked. No. We went around checking for duplicate people, and Lau did some strange things with his Dao. As far as we can tell, it was only one alien. Did you ever manage to find out why it fired the cannon of all things? No idea, Sam said, shrugging. I mean, it definitely was not the sharpest tool in the shed, and perhaps it messed up its orders. Either that, or it didn't realize that the alien general had retreated, and was trying to use the cannon to deprive us of another shot. In any case, it worked out well for us. It did indeed. Our fortunes have turned for the better it seems. Upon seeing that monster of a cultivator who led the alien army, I thought that we were dead for sure. Not even you could have beaten that thing. We have a short reprieve now however to rest and recuperate, and more importantly, gain more power, Lao said, his eyes glinting. Sam and Eduardo nodded in complete agreement, and the three men made their way into the city hall. It had been three days since they had captured the alien prisoner, and much had happened within that time. The city had grown, if not in size, then in strength. All of the turrets had been upgraded, and regular hunting parties were led out of the city by the captains to level up the weaker fighters. With that happening, Sam had entered a training binge, helping out those close to forming a Dao with his Dao pedagogy skill. As he did this, his comprehension of his own Dao deepened. He felt jealous that he could not use his skill on himself, but he already had enough of a boon in the way of the Dao anyway. Still, the prospect of exponentially increasing his rate of comprehension was quite alluring. Sam also sparred with the other captains occasionally, trying to hone his skills. It was not a very fair fight, and they had had to face him almost three or four to one for it to become fair, but Sam had still been able to further his understanding of his skills. In any case, the others were the ones who were receiving the real benefits. The cost of hiring a powerful person trainer within the multiverse could reach exorbitant levels, and Sam was doing all this for free. In that vein, he still had his token that would allow him to go off-world for special training, but he had not used it yet. If he left during this perilous time, his burgeoning faction could easily be destroyed by the invaders, or even the other factions. No, Sam would use it when all of this was done, and he had some spare time to train. In any case, the strength of the city had progressed nicely, and on the third day, Sam stood on top of the city hall, surveying it. This was the first time that he had been able to take it in as a panoramic sight rather than being simply someone walking within it, and the sight, coupled with the knowledge that his faction had built all this, staggered him. The city was organized in rings, with the most important buildings in the center, housing next, and then agriculture. The city hall was the central building as it held the metropolis core, and thus everything around it was organized in a circle, based on how the device worked. Next was the Dao tree, girdled in its protective shield, and guarded by Sarge. Sam had found out that the robot could only be used for defense, which crushed his dreams of sending the powerful robot out into the fray next time an alien army came calling. However, he could still be used for training. Occasionally, Sam would call the robot from his post for a few minutes to half an hour of sparring. In doing this, his combat skills had risen, even quicker than when he was fighting his captains. Of course, the limited time that he could spare for such training was slowing him down, but he was still near upgrading his mana bulwark skill. Sam had already been imbuing it with the power of Earth, but its usefulness had decreased in previous battles, and he had stopped really using it. An upgrade would change all of that. For now however, he watched the horizon for more invaders. After the first army had been vanquished, Sam had called for every tree within a large radius of the city to be felled, leaving no room for any surprise attacks. This, along with the superb eyesight of cultivators, meant that nobody would be sneaking up on them any time soon. In addition, the fact that the first army had teleported to their camp seemed to be an oddity. If such a thing was possible, then they surely would have been inundated by attackers by now. Instead, they had been left waiting. Sam jumped down from the top of the building, the distance barely hurting him, 
and spotted a scout heading towards the city hall at high speeds. Upon seeing Sam, the woman stopped and saluted. Faction leader. I bring news of an approaching army. They are about a few hours out at their current pace, and will be reaching us before nightfall. Good. It's been getting boring without anything to fight, Sam said, grinning. The woman saluted again, and ran off, to wherever scouts went after their duties were completed. The society of the city had begun to stratify itself, and there were distinct classes of people popping up. None were superior to the other, but they were all very distinct. There was a sizable artisan population, made up of people who preferred to further their craft rather than fight. There were a few people, like George, who wanted to both fight and craft, and then finally, there were the fighters. Over three quarters of the people here belonged to that group. They were divided into subdivisions based on their means of combat. There was a growing society of mages who were in the process of raising funds for a school, a large population of general warriors, scouts, and a ranged division. Sam's little faction was quickly becoming a force to be reckoned with. He cracked his knuckles and suited up for war. As his armor slotted itself onto his body, Sam ran in search of the other captains. He would need to find a way to communicate with them more efficiently. The easiest way was to join a party with them, and he was slowly warming up to that idea. Perhaps he would do so today. There was nothing to hide anymore after all. Notes from the author If you liked the story, please consider following, leaving a rating, slash review, or favoriting the story on Royal Road. Click on the link in the description. This would really help me out. Thanks. This would help chapters come out far quicker.